Have you ever wondered that life is a dream, an illusion, a transitory unstable state, an involuntary memory of loneliness, failure of communication, separation, and suffering? Fans of Gaspar Noé, controversial France-based Argentinian filmmaker, are familiar with these thoughts and questions, since they face them in every film of their favorite director. All of his seven feature films have brought these themes with a unique and extremely creative form and style, and his latest, Vortex, is no exception. It is one of the most serious films, if you will, by Noé, and exhibits signs of maturity in director's artistic vision. Noé's experiments with different forms and style make his movies distinctive and very stylistic. A close look at Noé's endeavors would show that what he's trying to achieve is to create a form as close to cinematic language as possible. Makis's ambitions resemble to those of avant-garde filmmakers. What do we mean by cinematic language? This phrase may have different meanings, but what we mean here is to create a form that can only be created through cinema, discovering or rather creating grammars of a cinematic language, in another meaning, achieving pure cinema, and utilizing techniques belonging to other mediums as less as possible. This makes a form that discovers and uses cinema's potential to create a medium unique experience. Noé is trying to show realities of human life through this pure cinematic language. But since he believed that life and this pure cinema resemble to each other, and has shown this resemblance in many cases, one could say that the artistic ambition of Noé is to show life and uncover what truly lies beneath it with cinema. Vortex depicts lives of an elderly couple both of them struggling with health issues. Dialogues, camera and segments it chooses to capture all seem arbitrary. Note how there isn't any narrative, drama, set design and continuity in the classic sense. Noé puts his film in contrast to what we generally expect of cinema. Just compare how a Hollywood film would dramatize the story of a loving couple struggling with old age and dementia. But not Noé, he does it differently, cinematically and towards deeper feelings. Every life is a dream, and dreams interact, but can never be the same. Each and every one of us look through the world through a unique window, or better say, perspective. This window is our dream. We may see other people through our window, and our views may overlap, but we can never share the exact same perspective. This is the cause of many of our sufferings. This makes us essentially lonely creatures, unable to truly communicate in a subjective level. This makes our lives seem like dreams, short existences, full of isolated struggles, directed at nothing real and effective, however, full of real and powerful feelings. Noah has chosen the lives of two subjects that perfectly fit this worldview. We have an elderly couple that seem to be close and have the color of decade-old love in their life. In the beginning shots of the film, we have only one screen. But Noah insinuates that even in this stage, we have two perspectives by showing the couple greeting each other from two windows across from each other. But later, the couple are separated by a thin black line. This is just when Ellie wakes up to an oblivion. And through the rest of the movie, we see two perspectives at the same time. Each screen is the window that belongs to a character. It's his or her perspective. And no matter what, two perspectives look at the world different from each other. Even if the characters are sharing a dialogue at the same place, each perspective is different from the other, spatially and temporally. Spatially different, since every character can be in a different location in relation to the other one. And even if they are in the same location, the angles and camera movements are different, making two perspectives of the same location different. And temporally different, since the feeling of time passed in each screen can be different. For example, in this scene, Louis' subjective time is paced faster than Ellie's. Another reason for this difference is that two screens are not cut simultaneously, and considering temporal features of editing, experience of time is different in two screens. This inevitable difference in perspective cinematically shows the loneliness of characters, and shortly later, we will discuss how it makes the audience feel lonely too. 
Cinema is a medium based on visual perception. This perception itself, based on modern visual culture and aesthetics and perception, is essentially fragmented and distracted. Cinema, as the pinnacle of modern art, is a practice room to cope with modernity and modern way of perception, thus making it a medium based on montage and distractive, fragmented perception, opposed to contemplative and continuous perception common in dealing with more classic forms of art. These studies on philosophy of cinema were done as early as 20s and 30s, and it was even back then that thinkers such as Walter Benjamin, in time-changing articles such as The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, warned cinema-going astray by film industry that intend to make cinema a product of commodity or fascist propaganda, and thus altering the nature of cinema to resemble classical forms of art, by, for example, creating illusion of continuity like the one we see in classical narrative cinema. Suffice to say, with dominance of narrative cinema, avant-garde filmmakers and auteurs such as Robert Bresson, Jean-Luc Godard and Andrei Tarkovsky began developing antithesis on this commercial cinema, usually utilizing techniques that disturb the illusion of continuity, such as non-linear editing and French new wave of cinema. Gaspar Noé too falls under this category. Searchers of the forms natural to cinema. Being a postmodern artist, Gaspar Noé makes his film self-referential, and one of his biggest achievements in this regard is Vortex. Our brain can't watch two different screens simultaneously, at least not contemplatively and focusing on details of each screen. So the film teases the audience. We are lost on where to look, and since our eyes usually follow movement, we either follow the screen that has more movement or the one that stars our favorite character. Anyway, we will realize the difficulty of following both screens and will probably be bothered. So we won't be drawn in drama, feel the same with characters, and will always keep a distance with the movie and its characters. With this happening, we will naturally and either consciously or unconsciously realize one of the poets of the film. We can't be the same in total subjective synchronization with anyone, such as characters contrary to what empathy toward characters in classic cinema claim. And just like the characters of Vortex, we too are alone. We will feel characters' pain, happiness, sadness, and love, just like they feel each other's pain, happiness, sadness, and love. But we will feel these in our loneliness, which makes it all more suffering. The pain of feeling and not having the ability to communicate in an ideal sense. Furthermore, we feel like that life is just a dream, or a dream within a dream, just like cinema, which we are conscious about it in this particular movie, making it, the cinema, seem like a dream. A dream within a dream, if we consider the fact that we are watching the movie in real life. The film makes us feel the same with characters in another way, one more based on the film's narrative device. To talk about this similarity, we need to further talk about characters. As we said earlier on, characters, in their inevitable separation, share the existential state of loneliness. But the film's narrative implies another existential state shared by them, suffering. Although the characters suffer from different reasons, this difference is only on the appearance. Suffering is essentially the same. Film gives us hints of this essentially the same suffering. Note how all three main characters are hooked on drugs in a way or another. Mother takes pills for her dementia, father for his heart problems, and the son is addicted to drugs. They're all suffering from memories of the past. Time is a problematic phenomenon for all of them. Ellie has problem remembering her past. Her life is a non-coherent segment, but Louis and Stefan suffer from this in another way. Louis is struggling with an old love affair. He is surrounded by memories of the past, but can't relieve those memories. Remember how he refuses to go to an elderly home because of the house he and Ellie lives in? His home is a small and narrow space to store memories of the past, almost a pathetic refuge. Stefan regrets and grieves his past mistakes, his life with his wife, whom incidentally is also sick and lies in hospital. It seems that all of them have lost the past and only a distant gleam of that past reaches them. 
and they are desperately trying to keep that gleam alive. All three of the characters are living in an existential dread, a life that day by day seems more meaningless, a dream within a dream, an illusion. It seems that suffering is a cycle. Everyone takes his or her turn at it, then passes on the cycle to another one. There is a remarkable scene in which we see Stefan doing drugs and all of a sudden his son comes to the room and watches his father in a state of euphoria. We feel like that the curse of suffering is passed on. It was passed on to Stefan from Louis and Ellie and from Stefan and his wife to their young son. The audience, exactly because of the film's formal structure, will take the similarity of suffering onto itself. We will feel this existential dread, a suffering shared by all human beings, a cycle we're also entrapped in. And this happens not through empathy, a future of classical cinema but through contemplation on the lives of the others. Film's characters, per se. Life is as illusory as cinema, and cinema is as real as life. This might be one of the points that Noah constantly tries to remind us. The resemblance and relationship between life and cinema. Louis is writing a book about cinema and dreams, and more impressive, this point is made near the end of the movie where we watch Louis's life shown in moving pictures. A dream is watched and finished to black screen. Illusion gone, non-existent over time. Just as time gets rid of everything belonging to Louis and Louis at the end of the movie, leaving window frames across each other empty. No trace, just as they never even existed. But the film, cunningly enough, doesn't end here. We see a shot of the city landscape, exactly the same as the one we saw at the movie's beginning. The bigger dream, life itself, keeps dreaming and repeating us. Thus, repeating the cycle of suffering. A point that Noah had made years before at the end of Irreversible. I think sometimes the debate on what's Noah's best film is as controversial as his films. And I would like to know what's your favorite film of his. So let me know in the comments and I appreciate hearing your thoughts on Vortex 2. Until next time, take care.